Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Weekly Poker Showdown brought to you by Party Poker. I am your host, Jamie Staples. This week on the show, we have Simon Trumper. Uh, amazing talking to him. I mean, an old school player. He's been playing poker for 25 years, uh, is the poker director at Dust Till Dawn as well. So a guy that has seen the older generation and been part of it as a professional has ushered in a new generation of players as well as a director of one of the most successful card rooms in the world. Uh, it's just awesome to pick his brain and, and a guy also very connected with the WPT World Online Championship this summer uh, and Devilfish as well, the main guy that campaigned for him being inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame in 2017. So the whole interview was awesome. I think you're all going to really enjoy it. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about some of the online poker news this week. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the High Roller Club. Michael Adamo won the 1 million guaranteed main event for more than 407,000, and Toon Mulder won the 5,200 main event for more than 90,000, but he also followed that up with 98,000 top prize in the 6 Max Second Chance 150K guaranteed event. So uh, pretty con incredible results for uh, both of those players there. We're going to cover some of the industry stuff going on this week. We talk all about the World Poker Tour uh, World Online Championship coming up this summer in the interview, so I'll leave that uh, for the podcast. But if you guys don't know about it yet, definitely uh, look it up and make sure you're aware of what's happening this summer. Um, PokerStars this week also released an infographic, which I thought was really awesome. Even as a guy sponsored by Party Poker now, uh, I think it's great when we call out good things happening in the industry. And PokerStars was very forthcoming about uh, returning $2 million to players from Cheats. Uh, in quarter four 2019, PokerStars returned $1.87 in confiscated winnings to players. Uh, 2,792 players had funds confiscated. There were 2,848 collusion and signature tournament review cases. 80% of those were proactively investigated by a PokerStars game integrity team. And 709 bot cases were investigated, 40% proactively by PokerStars. So I know Party Poker has been releasing reports as well as to the account closures, uh, and who they catch with cheating and the, the money that's released back. I think it's just so great to see PokerStars follow suit in that regard and showcase that they're doing a lot to ensure games are safe and fair. It's so important for our game. So uh, no matter the sites, uh, no matter who I'm affiliated or working with, I think it's a great thing when sites take security seriously because it's important. Now a big shout out here, the first Diamond Club Elite Cash player of 2020 is Duelist 12. Duelist has generated 200,000 in rake in 96 days after the promo started to gain Diamond Club Elite status. Uh, Diamond Club Elite players get 60% rake back, a VIP package to the Caribbean Poker Party, and entry to a Millions Online event. Duelist 12 achieved the feat playing two five PLO cash games. Uh, the Cyprus-based Greek player started his poker career with a $20 bankroll. Duelist said, I can't say it was an easy task. It took a lot of dedication and effort, but in the end, it was worth it. I mainly did it to prove to myself that I could do it. That's amazing, my friends. 200,000 a rake, uh, Diamond Club Elite, first of the year. Awesome stuff, and congratulations. So that's it for the online poker news this week. Let's jump right into the interview with Simon Trumper. Joining me on the podcast today, I have Simon Trumper. Simon, thanks for taking the time. Hi, Jamie. Good to meet you. I wanted to ask you about Dust Till Dawn. You've been the live poker director there since 2007. So how did you meet Rob Young? How did it all come together to where you found yourself in that role? Um, well, I was playing professionally um, back in 2005, and I was fortunate enough to make the final table with the inaugural 10K PLO. And Nick Whiten, Rob's best friend, uh, and Rob Young were, were railing me, basically. And right. during a break, um, Rob approached me and said, you know, we're thinking of opening a poker club. Is this something you might be interested in um, helping us with? And I said, yeah, you know, you know, that'd be great. You know, um, went back, played the final, uh, didn't hear back from them till December uh, okay. of that year, 2005. And they said, that we, we found a building. Uh, would you like to come and look at it? I said, yeah, sure. So I, I went along January 2006, drove up to Nottingham, um, had a look around. And at the time it was a, it was a, it's on a, industrial estate in Nottingham um, and it's uh, it was a place called Smiling Sam's um, and it used to be like um, a theme pub like a western okay. town and I remember uh, Rob opened it up and we went in with a torch and we're looking around and he's going <laughs> and they had like a, a bowling alley and pool tables and stuff you know like in this facade of a western town and he was saying yeah yeah he said and we're going to have like satellite area over here we're going to have this over there and you know what do you think and I said, wow, it's amazing. You know, what a fantastic building. And, and uh, I said, but I, I actually think we could do it a little bit differently. Uh, and believe it or not, what we did, we took a trip and we went, we went to Vegas 
and we went to Los Angeles. And I showed them places like the Hollywood Park, Bicycle Club, Commerce, uh, obviously the big ones in, in Vegas as well. And we came back and we ended up doing Dust of Dawn the way it is. Um, we had it designed. And it's like coming into a theater, you know, with the three three levels, uh, with a curve back. I think you've been there, haven't you? It's the most beautiful um, room I, I've walked into. Like when you walk in, it's set up in such a way that it, it's just like, the levels are really special where it's it's three yeah. levels like that. There's not another card room like it walking into it. You, you no. guys have done a great that, job. That's, that's what we were aiming for. And the thing about Rob is like, he's really passionate about poker and, and about perfection and you know giving the best possible experience to players. And, and he basically said to me, he said, I want you to come on board. and I, I want you to use your experience as a traveling poker player and, and give me bullet points of what would give you the best experience. And I, I literally did this. I literally sat down, I wrote down, you know, obvious things like, for example, being able to see enough clocks. So in the main room, there's like 24 screens, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, enough space between the tables, you know, comfortable chairs, quality cards, quality chips, you know, uh, professionally trained dealers. And, and I literally did all these bullet points, handed it over to him. And I'm not kidding you, every single thing he provided. And we ended up opening you know, uh, and uh, I'd like to think that, you know, we, we made a big difference. You know, Dust of Dawn has, has put itself on the map. And, and uh, from that humble beginning, you know, we've ended up in, in this position with Party Poker Live, you know, where we're providing <laughs> outside of a pandemic. We're providing live events all over the world with various partners. That that sounds very like Rob Young, I have to say. Like <laughs> the, the whole yeah. story of how he, how he put it together and worked with you. I mean, it's... Uh... Yeah, I, I can see him do it right now. It's pretty crazy that he picked you out from a final table. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's absolutely. our guy. It's exactly how it happens. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, I, I wanted to touch on poker because, of course, you were a poker professional before you, you mainly took up this role. So uh, I, I learned from Party Poker in preparing for this podcast. You were expelled from secondary school for playing poker dice after a maths exam. Uh, so did you always have poker and gambling as, as part of you from a young age? Not at all. I actually don't even remember where I got the poker dice from, but it is a true story. I was, um, you know, obviously, I don't know how old I was at the time, 15, I guess, 16, taking an exam. And in those days, we used to have the exams in the assembly hall, you know, so I'm right. in there, you know, with however many other people uh, on these little plastic chairs. Do you remember, like, the little, I don't know, if, like, in the UK, you used to have these cheap plastic chairs, right. little desk in front of us. And uh, anyway, Maths is one of my strong points. It's like, you know, I've, I've always been quick at uh, arithmetic and I finished really quick. So uh, I, I happened to have the poker dice with me and I took them out, took them out of the, the there's five dice, took them out and I started playing with them between my legs. <laughs> and I didn't realize how noisy it was. And then this teacher came over, gave me a tap on the shoulder, Trumper, <laughs> headmaster wants to see you. And I got expelled. Oh <laughs> I was, uh, that, that was it. I never, I never passed any exams. They expelled me on the dock. You know, that was it. Like, I, I never took another exam. Wow. So, uh, and I remember him saying to me, I can't remember his name, it's Devereaux, I think his name was. And he said to me, uh, Trumper, he said, I'm going to write a report. And he said, uh, you'll be lucky if you get a job as a dustman. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, well, there you go. But uh, yeah, and I, I then had a very unusual career. Um, but uh, from the poker side, uh, so no, I wasn't, I didn't actually play poker until I was late 20s. Um, I did play a little bit in pubs, you know, just, but it was, you know, just, I don't know, brag and stuff like that. So it wasn't really poker. Right. Um, but I had a friend of mine, a uh, much older guy who used to say to me, oh, they play poker in the casino in Reading. They play, you know, I'd love to go and play one now. I'd love to go and play. And I was going, oh, it's not really for me. I'm too busy. And anyway, he wore me down and, and in the end, I decided to go and I loved it. You know, from the very first time that I went, you know, I was playing a ten-pound tournament, right, uh, yeah. in Reading, uh, Pot Limit Oldham. Uh, didn't have a clue what I was doing, um, but I loved it, you know, and I loved the social side of it, you know, and it and it was so funny because there was a guy there who became a really good friend of mine, and we called him Lucky Bob, and everybody called him Lucky Bob, and and he kept making the final. Well, it wasn't luck. He was actually probably <laughs> the best player there, you know, but at the time I didn't realise it. I thought he was lucky, yeah. um, you know. So that, you know, so that was that. And then how it progressed is, is an unusual story, but it's true. I went to, uh, a friend took me to the Vic Casino in London, and he was writing a book on the probabilities of poker, right? Okay. On the mathematics side of it. Yeah. And he wanted to show me this. So we went back to his house, and he also on his computer had a floppy disk with the World Series of Poker game 
right? Wow. And he gave it. To me. Okay. He gave it to me, and he said, "If you, he said, what you do? He said, you start off with um, five thousand dollars, and you can go and play blackjack or uh, roulette, and you have to double it up to ten thousand, and then you can you can enter. I don't even know if this game still exists. He said you can enter the world series of poker. So I said, all right, I'll take it. So I took it. I'm stuck it in. Anyway, your little character can go. To, it's in Binions, and your little character can go downstairs into the shop and buy books. And, and, and they get sent up to your hotel room and you and you get a chapter of each book. Right. Um, anyway, so I did this and then I read them. And the first one was starting hands, you know, the top 20 starting hands. And the next one was uh, position play and stuff like that, you know. And I'm reading it and I suddenly thought, hold on a second, <laughs> there's more to this than I realised. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding you, just reading those basics completely changed my game because I had no idea before, uh, you know, about how important it was you know, right. position and starting hands, you know, and obviously ability to put players on hands and not just playing your hands, playing your opponent's hand and letting them think what you've got, you know, when you want them to think what you've got. And stuff Absolutely. Like that. Yeah. It, it like no opens up the world. Yeah. Yeah. I and, remember and, and, the same and, experience. And, like when I first started playing is you come into it with this expectation that it's, you know, some sort of frivolous game where you look, look your opponent in the face and you put them on a hand and then you yeah. you see strategy and you open up the math side and, and yeah. like the starting hands and uh, and it's like a new world, isn't it? It's just exciting. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine that? Just from that, you know, that one night going up the Vic yeah. uh, and putting that, you know, and it, honestly, it changed my poker career because yeah. all of a sudden I realized that it was skill based, not luck based. I, I like everybody who starts playing thought it was luck based, yeah. you know, and it's just the cards you get, the, the, you know, the cards that get dealt. Um, but just reading that little bit of information changed everything, you know, yeah. and, and then I suddenly realized that it's possible to become good at the game if you're willing to study and if you're willing to be self-critical, you know, and analyze every time you've, you've, you've done something wrong or when you finish a tournament, I used to analyze and overanalyze everything so that the next time I try not to make that same mistake. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I just fell in love with the game and, I, and I'm still in love with it 25 years later. Yeah, I, I want to ask you about those those early days because poker was so different, right? When I started 10 years ago, there was training sites. Like I could turn to the experts, read all their books, go through their training sites, you know, and and like I had a clear path as to how to get good. But, you know, you started playing 25 years ago. So who were your friends and how did you guys manage to like get better at poker? Was it just experience or did you study and learn together? How did it work? Um, well, I'll be honest, I've, I've never, the only book I've ever read Right, I read a couple of McAvoy's books on Nolan Oldham. Um, I've got both Stupid System, which Doyle signed for me when he came over to Dustful Dawn. Right. Um, I've only ever read the No Limit section. Um, so basically, I didn't have all that, all those tools. And, and the only way that you could improve is by talking to other players that you saw were successful. Right. I mean, to give you an example, um, how I became known in, in the UK poker world was, was uh, at the European Championships in 97. And this is where I met the likes of Serinda uh, Sonar and Donna Day and Devilfish. These people, these players were already revered in the European community. And in those days, you didn't have satellite qualification. You didn't have 200 events you know, happening live across right. Europe. And the European Championship was always held at, at the Vic in London. Um, and it was in July. And, and, and the top players from, from Europe would come over. And this for me was a big turning point because I started to play with these players and I realized that, you know, I was nowhere near their level, you right. know, not, not even close. And, but by watching these players, you pick up so much experience, you know, you know, watching how many hands they play, watching that they're not reading a paper in the middle of a hand. They're watching <laughs> what their opponents are doing, you know, and it, and it just kind of, it, that changed everything. And it was there that I actually met Delfish and that kind of, helped me as well because you know he, he kind of took me under his wing and used to give me lots of nuggets of advice and then i started to travel and and, and it came from experience the more i played the more i learned and, mm. and, and hopefully gradually i got better but i mean today it, it, like you said you can go on forums and stuff and since the boom since moneymaker you know won won the world's poker and then we've had the online boom and, and uh, the facilities for online tuition is just enormous isn't it yes and it's hard for you to understand if you've only been in 10 years 25 years ago there was probably three or four books that were available yeah. you know in the gambler's bookstore down in you know in vegas and that was it now how many books are there there must be a thousand books there's gonna be uh, yeah you know even like books yeah. I'll, I'll tell you actually the one book that i did find really fascinating there is uh, there's one other book that i did read cover to cover and that was book of tells by mark carrow right mark Caron, if you've never read it it's you know it was, i think it was done in the 70s 
Um, but I love psychology, so I, I found that really interesting. And, I, and the one thing I find that nowadays, younger, younger players coming into the game, they think it's all about aggression and mathematics, but I still think it's extremely important to understand the psychology of the game and to be able to you know, read a player yes. in, in the live, live arena. I th- you know, and I actually think it's fun to do. You know, uh, it, it has got more difficult because you like I remember like uh, you, if you said to me what's the main difference between 25 years ago and now it's quite simple in those days you could pigeonhole players really easy they right. were tight semi tight weak you know uh, and, and semi aggressive yeah uh, it was very very easy and they stuck to that play I mean it's really hard for you to believe this but this is what used to happen a guy would raise with Ace King you call with ten jack suited for argument's sake the flop comes five six seven they check. They yeah. didn't bet in those days. If they missed, they checked. If they hit, they bet. And I know it sounds hard to believe, but it really was that simple. Yeah. So it meant if you was in position, you could play any two cards against that opponent, you know, and you just, you could either steal it on the flop or re-steal on the turn. You could, you know, there's so many moves you could make. You can't do that today. No. Today, the players are so savvy with their bet sizing and their ranging. And, you know, they, they're always nine, nine out of 10 times they're doing continuation betting. And it, it's very, very hard. To, to, to beat that, you know, players that play that well. But that's what makes the game so exciting because you can become as good as that player. Yes, I, I, I remember watching some of the shows when you were probably in your heyday, right? And watching Devilfish, who we're gonna talk I about heard, in a second. Uh, watching him battle like Phil Helmuth, Helmuth and, and Yuha Helpy. And I remember yeah. them talking on those shows and, and people would phrase it as, I'm an aggressive player or I'm a tight player or I'm a, I'm a read player, or I'm a math player, yeah. right? There was no multifaceted. It was like, here's my strong suit, and this Absolutely. is how I'm known, right? Uh, yeah. That is very different. I think it's great you point that out. But let's talk about Devilfish here for, for a second, because you you campaigned to have Devilfish inducted into the Poker Hall of Fame, uh, which he successfully was in 2017. Uh, and yeah. my introduction to him is just on TV, and I think a lot of my generation and, and younger you know, may not have had the experience with Devilfish to know him. Uh, so... For someone that has seen him on TV but didn't have the opportunity to play with him or, or understand his impact, what what was Devilfish about? Um, right, okay. So in, in my experience, um, there are very few characters left in the game. You know, we do we do have some standout players. You know, so people that do you know that that do generate uh, you know interest for, right. from people and they, they like to follow them and stuff. Devilfish was totally unique. You know, I mean, I, I've never met anybody like him uh, off the felt or on the felt, to be honest. And I think anybody you, you ever meet who, who met him and played with him will tell you the same. The guy was um, absolutely fearless, you know. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I, I used to sit behind him in cash games. Um, like, uh, we, whenever we were traveling, he'd say, oh, you know, come and sit, you know, and we would play. And I'm not kidding you, he would destroy the table. You know, I've right. never seen anything like it. <laughs> and it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't just pure aggression. He just wouldn't stop talking either. You know, he just absolutely had them in the palm of his hands. And it was amazing to watch. There's very, very few people. I think I spoke to Mike Sexton about it. He said the only person he's seen that had a similar aura and could do it was Stu Unger. Right. Um, but, like, but it wasn't just that. Off the table, the guy could sing. He could play guitar. He could play piano. He was a stand-up comedian. You know, so he was a really fun guy to be around. You know, I, I had some amazing nights with him. You know, like uh, he, he brought his guitar with him to Marbella. We did a... We did a a, a tournament on two yachts would you believe that two Sunseeker yachts for charity <laughs> and they brought his guitar and every night he was just sat there playing his guitar you know outside of Tavona it was, it was incredible you know um, another time we were at the Master Classics in Amsterdam and as we're leaving there was a, a grand piano at the top of the stairs he just sat down and started playing for everybody right um, and he was quite famous for that he did it in Paris as well he did he, he, in the middle of uh, an awards dinner he just got up and started playing with the band um, you know and he was just like I don't know, just such a driven character, and he, you know, and he, he was so fast thinking. You know, he was like, if you ever saw any of his commentary, he could absolutely nail yes. someone's, you know, what they exactly what they're going to do next. You know, why they did what they did. You know, I, you know, he, he, in my opinion, he was he was one of the best commentators, um, and he was very funny as well, which you know, which made it great to watch him. Yeah, I mean, there's there's such there seems to be such magic around that generation and the way that they talked about poker and played poker and he seems like such a special guy um you know do we do we have hope in poker to get characters like him or or to get some of the magic back that seems to be missing sometimes from from that generation in that time yeah i think so i mean it's like 
Uh, at the moment, I think one of the problems is what you pointed out. Um, you know, most players take the game so seriously, don't they? And they've forgotten the fun element. You know, it is mm. supposed to be fun. You know, yes, we all want to win, you know, but it, it's about learning, you know, and improving your game and more importantly, enjoying the experience. Right. And I think that uh, that's one of the things that Dave did for everybody. You know, when he was on the table, when he walked in the room, you knew that if he sat down at your table, it was going to be fun. You yeah. know, you knew he was going to tell some cracking jokes uh, and, and he would be smiling as he took all your chips. <laughs> but, you know, you knew that would happen. Today, more often than not, when you sit down, you know, you, you, you have the younger players with their hoodies and their, you know, they've got the headphones on and the dark glasses and stuff like that. And there isn't as much banter. But I do find that, you know, it is starting to come back. I think people, you know, are realising that, you know, as much as we all want to win and, you know, there's, there's great opportunities to qualify into bigger events and stuff like that. Once you get there, it should be a fun experience. Awesome. Let's, uh, let's talk about the World Poker Tour World Online Championships, speaking of uh, big live events uh, yeah. that are moved online. Uh, so coming up this summer, we have 12 championship events, buy-ins from $33 up to $102,000. So quite a quite a range of opportunities there. Um, what are your plans for the summer? Are you going to play any of these events? And, and what are your feelings in regards to the WPT and Party Poker uh, collaboration? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I'd love to play some of the events. And, uh, you know, there's, there'll be a huge satellite program running behind mm. uh, all, all these championship events to give everybody from every single budget the opportunity to play. But I think... Um, the main thing that I love about uh, the championships that we produce is we've got 12 championship events. So we're focusing on 12 events rather than a plethora of events, um, you know, as, as traditionally would happen, for example, the WSOP, where they have like 80, 90 bracelets. Right. We wanted to focus on 12 championship events. And we basically, as you know, there'll be, there's going to be five championship club events uh, where they win a tournament championship uh, buying $15,000 buying for next year, which obviously is fantastic as well. Yeah. Um, but we basically, we want to have something that's prestigious. You know, we, we want people to be able to, we want people of all bank roles to be able to play it, which is why, as you said, you've got the mini micro and the main. So you've got, obviously you've got uh, outside of the main and the mini main, you've got the 3K main event championship events, but they've also got a 300 and a, and a, and a, th a 320 or 33 next to them. So that means that the, the idea of the WPT championships, it's accessible to all, right. you know? And I think that's something that's really important, you know? The reason that the two brands fit so well together is they believe in the same things. They believe that poker should be fun, should be accessible to all. It should be prestigious, you know, and it should be safe. You know, one of the things that, as you know, Rob brought in um, is the removal of HUDs, for example, you know, to level the playing field. And, 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 and we took that a step further, for example, in the, in the, in the, in the WPT World Online Championships, it's going to be a uh, single re-entry because right. we want it to be a level playing field. We don't want... Uh, the professional players to be able to come in and fire multiple bullets against the qualifiers, you know. So it's really important to us that you know to to put a stamp on it and say we're going to focus on these twelve events. You know, we've got the championship club as well. Uh, we're making it accessible for everybody. Below it, there's a satellite program which helps people even you know below that level that also want to achieve the aspirations of playing in a in a, in a world championship event. And I think we've nailed it. To be honest, I think I, I, I'm hoping that everybody's going to love what we've come up with. And I'm very excited to be playing it. Um, you know, I think it's July the 17th to September the 8th. So, you know, and I, I can't wait for it to start, to be honest. I think it's going to be very exciting. Yeah. From my perspective, I think you guys nailed the important parts. To, to me, the prestige is the thing I really yeah, miss sometimes absolutely. online and I crave, right? Because I'm primarily a, an online player. I came up playing online and to me... I've always wanted something that was meaningful I could work towards, uh, not just like a paycheck or, you know, you win a trophy that no one really knows or cares about. I wanted to win something special. So to me, this is like the perfectly designed series. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I want to ask you from constructing something like this, like how do you take the idea of a series? And a, and a collaboration, like how do you make a schedule around that? Like what is the thought process and, how do you do it? Well, obviously, there's a team behind all of this. It's a, you know, I, I primarily work with uh, Rob and Dan. Um, and, you know, what we do, we look at it and we go, originally, you could have took the concept of the WSOP, for example, which is, you know, multiple bracelets over, over a period of time, one or two bracelets a day. 
and we could have followed that format and come up with a, a world championship like that. But what we wanted to do was do something more prestigious that, that like, I, you know, targeted specific, um, like eight max, six max, mix max, knockout, you know, turbo, heads up, high roller, yeah. and, and just focus on those, you know, th th those events. And then what we wanted to do, we thought to ourselves, right, why don't we do it in weak chunks? So we started the series with PLO, high low, then PLO. So you have a week of PLO, high low, week of PLO. Then from the 1st of August to September the 8th, it turns to no limit. And obviously you've got your eight max, your six max, um, you've got your, you know, your knockout, and then you've got the mini main and the main, uh, and then we finished off with the high rollers. And so th the idea was that if we could do it like that, then it gives the players the opportunity to focus on what it is they want to play. And then obviously, we're hoping that the players that then are successful either through the satellite program or through winning in the earlier weeks will then stay on and play the later weeks. You right. know, some people will just focus on the main event. I mean, I think actually, I think the star, one of the stars of the, of, of the events is, is the mini main, you know, one K buy in 5 million guaranteed. Yeah. You know, I think that's going to be absolutely phenomenal. I mean, that's something surely you'd, you'd want to play. I'm in there. I'm streaming it. Yeah. I know it'll be uh it'll really? be a Twitch extravaganza for sure. A hundred percent. How yeah, could yeah. you miss cool. it? You know? That's uh, how many entrants is that going to need to hit the guarantee? Five thousand. That's that's a lot of people playing a one thousand yeah. dollar poker tournament. So, uh, yeah. so I, yeah, no, I, I'm excited yeah. for and it. The other thing, we the, the, obviously, as you know, with Rob, it's it's all about level playing field, which is why they're going to be single reentry. Uh, but it's also about when you're working with a brand like WPT. You know, it's very very important that we recreate as much as possible the live experience. And in doing that, what we've done is we've took like the, the, the WPT live structure and made it online friendly, you know? Right. And then what we've done is we've, we've tried to give the best possible clocks. So for example, we'll work out what, you know, what guarantee we're putting on an event and we'll, we'll calculate how many levels that event's gonna take. Once we've done that, we'll calculate if it's a three day event, how we're gonna break those levels up over the three days. Right. Once we've done that, we'll work out what the best clock we can give the players. And it's all about, with Rob, he'll always say, can we give them more? Can we give them this? Can we extend, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, late range? You know, can we, uh, can we make sure that it doesn't go down to a small big blind? You know, how can we give the optimal structure, structure for the players? And, and to give you an example, um, the 3K Championship event is gonna have like a clock of 25 minutes day one, 30 minutes day two, 45 minutes day three. Yeah. And the main yeah. event is 25 minutes day one, 40 minutes day two, 50 minutes day three, and 60 minutes in the final. You know, and uh, you don't get this online normally, do you? So, no. you know, the opportunity to play these long clocks uh, is going to, it means without a doubt, it remains prestigious. And I think that was one of the things that we really wanted to achieve. You know, that we have two brands that have similar focus. They want prestigious events they want events that are fun to play and they want to provide quality you know and 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 i think that's really what party poker live party poker and, and, and wpt are all about and i think that we have achieved that i'm hoping that the players agree with us yeah like when when you go to a live poker tournament right if, it, if it's early you know if it starts at 11 or 12 i guess that's early for poker players it is for me you know, yeah. you grab a coffee and you're settled in for a day, right? It's it's a moment yeah, in time where absolutely. you're gonna play. It it doesn't feel like that with a normal online schedule, but but yeah. creating that that slow clock feel creates that environment of like, all right, this is what I'm doing today. I'm playing this tournament yeah. and and this is the thing. It's it's a moment. So, um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the shooting star and the charity tournament? Because I know those are some aspects that are very different from yeah. like just normal poker tournaments. They're, they're sort of unique to the WPT uh, and and Party Poker Live. So what's yeah, up with that? Well, we, we thought it would be fun to start off with an industry event um, for everybody, whether you're in the casino industry, gaming or poker related. Right. Um, so we're doing the poker industry event, um, I think it's $300 to enter with a 30K guarantee. It's on the 17th of July. Um, to enter that, you do have to go on to Party Poker Live and, and you know, fill in an application form because you obviously do have to prove that you're in one of those three areas. Right. Um, but I think that's going to be a really cool thing to do online, you know, to, 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 to say to all the people that are currently in this pandemic, they're all sat at home anyway, to say, guys, here's something for you. You know, come on, come on, come on to Party Poker and, and, and play this event. Um, so that's that. With the shooting stars, again, it's all about fun. You know, it's all about saying to the players, it's kind of like halfway through uh, the festival. I think it's, all, it's uh, 29th of July. Um, so now we've extended September the 8th, it's kind of, you know, after the first couple of weeks. So we start off with the poker industry, a couple of weeks later, we have the shooting stars. 
Now, with that, as you said, it's, it's, uh, we're going to be raising money for charity. Um, it's $1,100. Uh, the $100 edge fee is, is, is going to be going to a charity that we're going to choose, probably going to be COVID-related. Um, right. you know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll know this week. Um, and there's going to be around about 50 um, top-known players and celebrities um, from all walks of life. You know, there might be a snooker player, you know, right. rugby player, you know, sports person. There might be reality TV, that sort of thing. Um, and they'll have a $500 bounty on their head. But, you know, I think it will be an awful lot of fun to play. Uh, hopefully, um, Kevin will be playing, you know, that uh, uh, you did a podcast with him and Rob. Um, oh, that'd I'm be sure that uh, if we could get him on, players would be really excited about that. Um, but, you know, it, 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 again, it's nice to have something with the charity aspect, but also it's a, it, it's a reminder to players that poker can be fun. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and, and last, I just wanted to ask you about, because with COVID, it's a very unique situation, uh, as you know, yeah. right? Being the director of Dust Till Dawn, uh, which is a live yeah. venue. So we've seen collaboration with the WPT, with Poker Masters, even with like yeah. um, Dust Till Dawn and Playground hosting some events online. Um, so I wanted to ask your thoughts in regards to what you think the future might hold for live tournaments uh, and, and live venues collaborating with online. What are your thoughts on that space? Well, I think you're right. And it, I think the collaborations have been extremely successful. You know, um, like you say, at the moment, we've got the Poker Masters PLO online, which obviously is a high buying uh, event, you know, uh, 500 from 1,000 through to 51,000. It's been smashing all the guarantees. So did the super high roller bowl before. So, you know, so at that level, you know, there clearly is, you know, the collaboration has worked. But then when you look at the WPT that we did, and, you know, and as you said, you know, some of the other collaborations we've done, uh, it's brought other brands online. Uh, we've brought the Latam America KSOP, the EAPT from Russia, and all of them have been working. And obviously these are our live partners as well. And I, I think, to be honest, even after the pandemic has calmed down and we are able to start playing live again, I think that what's happened is it's going to bring lots of new players that weren't familiar with those brands, weren't familiar with those uh, tournament experiences, and it's going to bring them online. They're going to play both online, but also want to qualify for the live version as well. Yes. So I think it's going to actually help the industry. I think the, 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 the people, once they realize, at the, at the moment, they've got no choice but to play online. So they come online, they come on Bike Poker, they see the, the WPT World Online Championships, they see the satellite program for it, they play the satellite program, they qualify, they have a great time, great experience. Some of them are going to win a lot of money. It's going to be life-changing for some of them. They remember what a great experience they had. So when the next live event comes up, they go back to Party Poker, hopefully, and you know they look at uh, qualifying for the live version of it as well. And I think that uh, overall, it's going to be positive for the industry. Right. I Well, I'm, I'm very excited. I mean, I guess... I wear both hats sometimes. Obviously, I'm on the party poker side, but as a player as well. And as a player, I think it's really exciting what you guys have created. So a big thanks for the work you've put into it. Uh, and I'm just looking forward to playing this summer, Simon. So uh, thank you so much for taking me through some of your poker history, Devilfish. Uh, the the tournament's coming up this summer. It's been a blast and and uh, appreciate having you on. Okay, cool. Look forward to seeing you online. Big thanks to Simon for coming on the podcast. Really interesting to hear his stories. Uh, I know there's so much more I could have asked him, but try and keep the interview to 30 minutes. So I look forward to having him on again in the future if you'll have me, Simon. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Now, before I let you all go this week, we have our weekly competition, the hashtag JS Poker Hero competition. Now, we give a $215 million ticket to one of you listening slash watching the podcast. All you have to do is tweet to this question on Twitter using the hashtag JS Poker Hero. Hashtag JS Poker Hero, and you may win yourself a 215 ticket. Now, last week's winner, uh, congratulations to Anis Badra for correctly answering. There are 12 championship events at the WPT World Online Championships. You win a 215 Party Poker Million ticket. So good luck. This week, Ragnarok starts uh, on Thursday. Now, can you name one of the characters the tournaments are named after? Use the hashtag JS Poker Hero. Ragnarok is a new promotion going on at Party Poker uh, where you called upon to prevent Ragnarok from happening by collecting and uniting Odin's forces against Loki. Pretty cool. The superhero aspect coming in here. I like it. It's an interesting story. So check that promotion out. Go ahead and answer this question using the hashtag JSPokerHero, and maybe you will win a ticket to the Party Poker Million this week. Thank you all so much for taking the time today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you're listening on iTunes, a rate and subscribe would be awesome. Spotify, you just do your Spotify thing. And YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, as always, is much appreciated. Thank you all so much for taking the time. But until next week, we'll see you later.